The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. It's like genuinely a good spring suit, though. Well done. Obama would approve. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I like the color. <laughs> I would. I just. I am in DC, but I don't think I'll find him here. Ten-year-old pop culture reference for those in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Suits are only meant to be worn like twice a year. Are you at that the global health yeah. conference there? No, I'm at in Society for Addiction Medicine. All oh. of these conferences in DC, they're great. They all yeah. have acronyms too, and they're yeah. all kind of yep. the same. Yeah. Like I was just looking up APSA, which is what I thought was the American Physician Scientist Association mm. is also the American Political Science Association. <laughs> it is. Because I was looking for conferences and I was like, oh my gosh, a conference Look, in We September. only have That's 26 letters great. to work with, so. <laughs> like, I know, but why are we acronyming everything? I don't think we need more acronyms. Like, I really don't. I don't think we need to acronym every association and or society. Perhaps we could just name them with like people names. Honestly, though, when I get to that F, that I know they're a fellowship of some college of something, yeah. and I'm like, oh, some association. I don't care what it is. The last acronym thing that I will say is that I have recently read the book Cultish, which is about the language that cults use. And one of the oh. big things is that they use acronyms a lot. And that is like a sign of a cult, which like, spoiler, medicine's a cult. We all kind of knew that. But yeah. <laughs> once you think about it, like we create in groups and out groups literally just based on can you even understand what this random string of letters means? Yeah, that's yeah. true. And Jargon that is, is all about. what I would like to put as number one evidence of medicine being a cult. I'm paying a lot of money to be a part of the club. Yeah. That's also a sign of a cult. Sounds like. Making yeah. great sacrifices for unreasonable things. <laughs> being just contractually like obligated to do stuff <laughs> <laughs> under penalty of being shot <laughs> if you don't. I just feel like Listeners, there's a lot of things a in medicine or in general that like people are like, oh, it's very culty, but then we just throw out the word culty a lot and really what we mean is people like to have in groups and out groups. Turns out evolutionarily speaking, there's an advantage to having in groups and out groups, right? Yeah. For um, sure, I'm using the word cult, like, not as aggressive as it could be used. Yeah. Using it yeah. more We're vaguely. Being facetious, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Coat Podcast. Weird news. Fresh views. Helpful clues and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome like. back to the Short Code Podcast, <laughs> the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose. It's a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Hitler. It's Friday. It is. Happy Friday, Dave. It's a Friday. It's a beautiful spring day. I, I'm so excited that spring has finally sprung in Iowa. With me today in the SCP studio, he's the king of dandelion wishes. It's M1 Jeff Goddard. Just here to make your wishes come true. She's the raindrop whisperer. It's Aline Sanduk, PhD, <laughs> PhD. Like that. Like that. Yes, <laughs> that's all we're gonna say. We're not gonna reveal anything else. Let the audience sit in their own confusion. We'll no, talk we'll talk more about somewhere. that. She's the fairy godmother of spring. It's MD, PhD student Riley B. and Bush. Hello, everyone. And he's the beekeeper of your dreams. Joining us from the internet. It's M3 AJ Chowdhury dressed for this intro. Smooth Spring. like honey. With his Blessing. with his light linen suit looking ass. <laughs> Aline, congratulations on achieving part one of your dream. You're a PhD. Thank you. Semi officially now. I know graduation is when you get the actual degree, but you've done it, baby. Do you want us to call you Doc? Is that no, something that... absolutely not. Okay. Professor. Only David. She prefers professor. <laughs> oh. Professor. <laughs> okay, professor. Good, good job, okay, Dave. Prof. That's right. <laughs> no, please don't. That's so embarrassing. But it's done. It's over. You defended your uh, PhD, your yep. dissertation last week. So yeah. trial by combat? or how, Yeah, how was yep. it? Um, in part. And then there's conversation. And they have you step out of the room. So they can cure their wounds and you can cure yours. And then it's crazy. I'll never get over the way that we do these meetings where like they have you step out of the, do they do this for you, Riley? They, your committee has you step out of the room. Yep. They talk about you. 
and then they laugh and you're not sure what they're laughing about, but they're probably just talking about their weekend. They but they might be laugh. talking about you. Yeah, the, you just they're probably laugh. just like trying to like bide their time to get to like they feel as though they need to have conversation, but really it's just like a we good? Everyone's good. Yeah, what but they're then doing they have is, to spend five minutes. I think what yes. they're doing is they're looking at each other blankly. Probably. Like, okay, we need to do something <laughs> with this time. They have a timer in the background that's like, okay, laugh now. Ha 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 ha. Ha. <laughs> ha yes. All right. And go back to quiet chatter. It's like, I don't know if yeah, the laughter the makes anyone feel better. Vibe check. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's kind of an antiquated system, but like at this point, we just, we like our, we like our traditions, you know? Traditions our, our are very strong. Traditions. Traditions are important. In academia. Yeah. Especially in academia. Lots and lots of traditions. That's true. But what did you have to, I don't know, like, what did you have to actually do? I know you're defending Defend. your dissertation, but to me that means this is a great, very little. This is a great question because I saw a TikTok where it was like somebody that goes in and is like yelling at people trying to defend their dissertation. Yeah, and I've seen like, <laughs> like don't even talk to me. This is my dissertation. Walk and I've seen away. like in movies or whatever, like people going in to defend their dis. I, I don't know what I can't remember a single movie, like the title of a single movie where I don't it know featured either, somebody. Actually. But I feel like, you know, you sit in a chair at the front of the room and there's a panel of people behind us desk or a table or so, something looking at you i imagine you're on stage and they're just sitting in the front row just in the four audience people. pelting you with <laughs> questions so in some programs how big is your sword yeah no <laughs> the biggest you have, you have to come prepared okay man yeah some programs are like very aggressive and like they really hammer you i did not have that feeling going into my defense and like so basically you write your thesis and that's you can put whatever you want in it, but essentially it's like a summary of everything you've done and what you think it means and how it fits into like the broader story of the topic that you're looking at, you know, how it gels with other people's findings in the field. And then you give a seminar. How long? Usually an hour. Okay. You know, it can be a little bit longer, but an hour I think is pretty standard. With questions sprinkled without or? So it is actually against the law for you to be made to defend your thesis in the presence of other people, not on your committee. It's actually illegal for that to happen. So really? So the point of the seminar is just like it's pageantry, basically. It's like all of your friends and your family coming to hear you talk about your science. And it's this like very triumphant moment. It also fulfills the purpose of you giving your talk to your committee. Right. But they're technically your committee members aren't allowed to ask you questions about it. Like they're not supposed to start the examination until everyone else is out of the room. They're not supposed to. I think I think it is like it violates some like s student bill of rights or something. I don't know. Probably FERPA. FERPA. Yeah. FERPA. Yeah. Actually, that's yes. You guys are wasting their acronym. Yeah. But that one's fun to say. So it's OK. Yeah, FERPA. I agree. I hurt my FERPA. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they hurt my. They hurt me right in the fur right. Um So yeah. So then everyone else leaves, and we actually went into a different room, and we just sat around like it was one of the conference rooms. But sometimes, yeah, people will sit all in front. That's how you see it in movies. It's like this very old, like wooden hall and yeah. like a very old building, and you're like in one. Boards. Yeah, yeah, and you're literally in like a wooden seat from the '60s <laughs> where many children were beat by nuns. <laughs> and there's just this row of academics that are very severe looking, asking questions. And they're saying things like. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, no, my, you know, I'll be honest, like by the end, I wasn't really afraid of my committee. I was a little bit like, yeah, what have you guys done for me lately? You know? <laughs> and well, so, you have the biggest sword there, of course. I mean, you know, a little bit. But um, what, what was the the topic of your dissertation? Yeah, so I ended up doing something completely different than what I expected. And it stunk because I don't have any expertise really in the stuff I ended up doing. But I ended up doing like a structural biology project looking at the monomer form of this protein that my boss is very excited about and then the dimeric form and what that might mean for its function. And so we did all these like biochemical analyses and, and different structural studies and trying to characterize it. And then everything else, I, I don't know. I was very surprised. Like they asked me about all these things I didn't end up putting in my thesis because I thought that they were, I thought it was garbage. And they were like, well, you had that one cool finding, you know, a little while ago. And I was like, no, it wasn't. That was like, cool. <laughs> it, well, all right. I mean, if you think I, you didn't say at the time that it was cool. Like, you, I don't know. I, it was, I was, there was like discordance there. 
But I was like, oh, I guess I should have put that in there because I ended up having two data chapters. And for the second data chapter, I straight up was like, I, there's only a second data chapter because John literally made me write one. I would have just put the one in. But they started asking me about all these things. And I was like, I thought you guys didn't like that stuff. Like, I thought you thought that stunk and I thought it stunk. So that was like a nice moment. But mainly they were just like asking me about my work and asking me questions that I investigated with experiments and then like what I would do next or what I think it means. And there were some things where they were like, you could have pushed this a little further. You could do this and that analysis. I mean, you don't have to. And I was like, I'll do it. But whatever, you know, this is <laughs> you guys are in charge here. Basically, it's just like just getting a sense of like how you think, how you ask questions, how you go about answering questions using the science and then figuring out where it fits with everything else. Because that that is the whole thing about science. It's all cumulative. It feels like you're operating alone, but like really we're kind of all in this together, even though it doesn't feel like it sometimes. And so figuring out what's already known and where you can plug the holes to get the fullest pictures is the real objective. So how important is it? <clears throat> you have made some sort of breakthrough during your PhD um, thing. I think everyone wishes they like make a scientifically valuable finding. But like, even this isn't it is a valuable finding because you just saved someone else six years of their life trying to find something that's not there. I think one for the team. That's nice. A little bit. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes so. novelty doesn't look like curing cancer or discovering a new protein or whatever. Like I think... What is novel sometimes is I discovered this part of a pathway. And that's really important, too, because, again, it sets up yet another kind of link in this pathway that five other people might actually be trying to investigate further. I think that's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. And it also happens where people find things that the utility or the value isn't immediately obvious. But then once the rest of the picture becomes clear, then you have this unpredictable benefit sometimes to science. I'm glad I did it. I wish I did more. I wish I was more successful, but. We well, you, all wish we you, were more successful. You can work on that after your residency. Yeah. I think you'll be okay. You know, I got to tell you, as I was <laughs> She's getting. never ready, doing this again. No, as, as I was getting ready for my defense, I was like, I'm <laughs> never looking at this shit again. And then almost immediately afterwards, I was like, you know what? Maybe I will do that analysis. Was trying. Todd was right. That's actually a good idea. And then I was like. It was like flipping a switch because now I didn't have to do the science. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to do it for fun and for pleasure. And I was like, and that's why it's cool. Like science Until is Until cool. you write a grant yeah, for I your think, work yeah. and then all of a sudden you're doing it for a grade again. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm doing a summer research project in South Africa oh, cool. in a couple of months and getting that funded. I have applied to so many different fellowships and grants and scholarships and all of this stuff. And it is exhausting it's hard trying yeah. to convince people that hey give me money because this is going to make the world a better place i also recently yeah. received i would say a score for my f30 but it wasn't actually scored so for those who don't know f30s are the kind of nih grants that md phd students will write f31 is the kind of phd student route and you write it and you say give me money to fund the rest of my program and you lay your whole soul out you say why am i a good applicant you say why is the university of iowa a great place why is my project super important and it goes to three people and they read it and they decide, should this be discussed in a panel of people? Mm -hmm. And 50 percent of those grants or some number, I actually don't know what it is, just like never get discussed. They never even get to the panel of people. Yeah. And to be triaged like that was a knife to the chest. I'm going to resubmit it. But it's super bitter. Like writing these grants is just such a bummer in a lot yeah, of ways, hard. even though it. Is such an important. You sound like process. you have Stockholm syndrome almost. If I'm gonna be honest, I do not know I've what been, Stockholm I've been syndrome is, but I would love. Yeah. In the chest. <laughs> okay. I'm doing it again. <laughs> then yes, I exactly. I have exactly mm. that, which is I forget the next day about how much it hurts, and then I do it all over again, it with really a little is. bit more of a chip on my shoulder. But <laughs> it's such a painstaking process. Science in general is just like build you up to tear you back down. One experiment, awesome. Next experiment terrible i mean you're you're outsmarting nature yes <laughs> like that's the job and like, nature's been around a lot longer than any of us have so it's got all these loopholes and all these exceptions and we're trying to find the laws that are governing all these phenomena but it's not as clear as it might seem sometimes it is and honestly a lot of it happens by accident 
Like, yeah. It's really Penicillin. shocking. <laughs> yeah. There's like a, a treatment that is like very easy and simple for kids born with like hemangiomas. So I'm on ophthalmology now and we talk about that. And it's propranolol. It's just a beta blocker. Whereas like before they used to operate, it's just like a vascular tumor, basically. Is but that the like the port wine stains they still do or operate. something like that? Or is it different? paper on hemangiomas. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess some people still do. It's the same category, Dave. Yeah. It just depends on where it is. The way people figured out that propranolol like forces hemangiomas to regress. And AJ, since you wrote a paper on this, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was completely by accident. Like there was a kid who was born with like a congenital abnormality that they gave propranolol and also happened to have a hemangioma. And they were like, oh, it's going away. I wonder why that is happening. And that's how they figured out that you can treat it that way. So I don't know, is that, did you come across that at all, AJ? Uh, the hemangiomas in my paper were in vertebrae. So you kind of have to cut it out. But gotcha. yeah, I guess yeah. like lowers blood pressure, less blood flow goes to an angioma and therefore it'll regress. Yeah. I think one of the valuable things that we're slowly as a society getting more comfortable with when looking at science, I think scientists are a little bit better, but as, as a human being, I like simplicity. I want simple answers, right? And being able to say Well, there's that the whole like, Occam's razor thing that yeah. gets cited on, you know, right? Yeah. Except like reductionism doesn't work, you know, like- not Your body biology. doesn't work because <laughs> this chemical mixes with this chemical and therefore you have this reaction. There's a black box of thousands of reactions that are happening between taking the pill and the pill actually doing what you want it to do. You don't know what most of them are. You know the ones that seem to be effective, which is great. But like even just a couple of weeks ago, I emailed one of my professors. We were talking about pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics and I, we were talking about how drugs are metabolized in your body right and so i reached out and i was like oh so how does your microbiome affect this i know this is an area of research i just don't know if we're going to talk about it in our course and the professor literally said it's too new we're not going to talk about it in our course but it is a fantastic <laughs> field of study right this idea that oh there are tens of millions of little critters in your tum-tum that change how medicine affects you as an individual it's kind of wild who knows we yeah. don't know yet. Isn't that crazy? So it is. So it's like you're just exploring a new frontier. Yeah. And that's there's something really cool about that with science, yeah. even when it breaks your heart and there's bureaucracy and you have to convince people that your science really matters. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, like you're understanding pieces of this vast universe that were not understood before you came along and did the work. Yeah. So yeah. like how many pages was your thesis? A hundred you write a hundred pages on the new thing that like yeah. people just didn't really fully get before or the, all the work that you did that got you to a point where maybe it didn't ultimately like show. Yeah. Like negative results are just as important. I think that with some humility, science is like the mo one of the most beautiful things that we do as I a agree. species. You know, we're just like just trying to figure it out, you know, and yeah. we don't know. And that's so I don't know. I just, it's cute for me. I'm just like, I think it's so sweet. Yeah. It's just cute. <laughs> Yeah, it's so cute. To me, science is like the like pursuing science as an adult is the equivalent of being a kid and just like wanting to explore outside. Yeah, like, kind of. It's agree. really that's it. It's just exploration. It's creative. It's not this stuffy thing that I think people think it is. Like, I actually think science is way more creative than something like medicine is. Maybe that's a hot take. Oh, but, damn. I mean, I damn, would say girl. that a thousand times over. Say like, creative. I think it's way more creative than medicine. You don't medicine. want medicine to be creative. You exactly. want medicine to work. You want medicine you know? to yeah. work. You want it to be exactly. regimented. Like yeah. you want when a patient comes to you and they're like, I have the flu. You want in your brain to go to an algorithm of like X, Y, Z. Here's what I do for mild, moderate, severe flu. Yeah. Science is like, hey, here's a hundred papers. Read them all. Figure out what hasn't been done before, which sounds absurd. But you read them and you think <laughs> of all the 10,000 things that you could do. And then you go to your thesis defense and they say, why didn't you do X, Y, and Z? And you go, I don't have all the hours of the day. Yeah. All of those are great answers. But again, you could think of questions for the rest of your life. It was stupid when I turned down that offer for infinite time yeah. and, <laughs> and funding. Yeah. Funny how I can't just be in this already long program for even longer. Yeah. Well, again, Aline, congratulations on getting to this point. I know it was a long road. Mm. And I don't know. It's good to see you so relaxed, at least for a few minutes. <laughs> I felt like a whole new person. Actually, I will say, I think the cutest moment is after, you know, they have you step out of the room at the end of the defense and they talk about you. My boss came out and just like stuck his hand out and goes, doctor, 
And I shook his hand. I go, doctor. And then I walk into the room. And then all of the professors like, doctor, 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 doctor. So yes, doctor. And it was oh, actually, it. you know what? That alone was worth it. Yeah. Six years for that moment. <laughs> <laughs> the, most, the most wholesome of moments. <laughs> it was very cute, though. Yeah. And just people patting me on the back as they're, you know, getting on with their day. It was very... I think that was the nice thing, like being part of a community and being, it felt very collegial. Yeah. So. So are you on a first name basis with everyone now? No, they call each other doctor. I just, that's it. (laughs) Everyone's doctor. No names anymore. Yes, we're peers now. Yeah. I'm equal to them, of course. So it's, it's, it's John and Frank and all that. Mm -hmm. Right. Short Coats, we love to hear from you. No matter what. That's it's cool. about so call us at three four seven short CT with questions, shower thoughts, complaints about your situation, whatever you like. We'll talk about it on the show. Do you feel proud? I do feel proud of myself. I think there's so much more growth that goes on. We're talking about this too long. I'm so sorry. There's a lot that goes on in a PhD that's so much more than the bench science. Like you grow as a person. Like I underwent a lot of personality change. Like I never, I never at the start of my PhD would have imagined being like. Like going to my thesis committee and be like, yeah, what are you guys going to do about this? Like that was it was very empowering to, you know, maybe not say that directly, but to come on, of, John, get something done. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, to walk into the room and be like, yes, we are a team here. Like if I am not progressing the way that you want me to, I am such a smaller part of it. It's the system is designed to support me to succeed to the, the best of my ability. And I think that was a really a healthy realization for me towards the end of my PhD is realizing that it really does take a village. It takes a village to do science. And I have some interesting predictions for the future, but I think the days of students doing everything themselves are soon coming to an end. It just, it's so wildly inefficient. I think in the future, we're going to move more towards like a core model. You're going to have more bigger, better funded, more specialized cores and PIs are going to be like a hospital model. You know, you want to ask a question, you put in an order to a core, like putting in a lab order because it's just something I really struggled with was just technical difficulties at every turn and troubleshooting everything. It was infuriating. Yeah. And it should not have been that like I spent way less time during my PhD directly asking and answering questions and that is the point of your graduate work you should know how to troubleshoot experiments and how to develop techniques but that shouldn't be more than like 20 or 25 percent of what you do but for some people it ends up being the case but i'm very proud of myself yeah good very very long answer to that question i want i have one last thing to say about this and that this is it just popped into my head, but I remember listening to you on the Shortcut podcast before I ever came to this program. And I thought to myself, I'm thinking back and I remember the idea of wanting to go to an MD PhD program and listening to you talk about it, like got me so stoked to be coming to do this thing. So oh I just wanted God. to say that it's weird. It's wow. like a really weird full circle moment. And that I remember listening to you all the time thinking, wow, she's so cool. MD PhD doing this podcast thing. And so like, and oh you know God. what? I just want to <laughs> let you know that like you were a really pivotal part of like even my journey to like enjoying this thing that is like medicine and science. And so despite it all, like you made that kind of impact on my life, even in this little thing. So I don't know why I've got that. Up. But it's a really warming. cool thing to have, like to see you at the end of the road and think the fact that you were kind of with me along my whole path at this point. So you have no idea. Dying that, over here. That I'm means dying so much. I did not happiness. expect. Technically, I listened to you as well. Somebody's like, cutting onions. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh. And you know what? You're going to be that for someone else. There's someone who's going to end up here who's going to be like, I remember the first episode of The Short Coat where Riley was talking about her research, talking about her F30 and how hard she worked on that. It's going to, you're, I'm, it means so much to me that the dumb jokes I made every week with my friends like was useful <laughs> and you know even remotely uplifting but well you left an impact about science just being cool and it doesn't have to be so serious so I love that that is the point isn't that's it that's the point yeah. it's supposed to be fun even yeah. when it's not it, it can it can be fun it, it can should be, be fun, fun. <laughs> so yeah so, thank you for saying that yeah. you're pretty awesome <laughs> <laughs> it's very the feeling is wow. very mutual <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 
Let's just end the show there. I, what a I mean, number. that is the episode, my friend. I don't know. Done. I have this whole other part of the show. That, that doesn't matter. That the, This was so uplifting. <laughs> we, we can only go downhill from there. I feel like, yeah. You actually cut to an Aline montage after this of just <laughs> things that she said on the show ever. Oh my god. Amazing. I'm actually like really looking forward to the next several years, the the future Riley's coming on and be like, yeah, because of these girls that were like MD PhDs and so Man, cool, we all decided to do it. I'll just know? like so leave like, the room because I can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> just balling. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it would be really funny actually if if in this moment Dave was like, hey, remember all that stuff you asked us to cut out? Here it is. Surprise! <laughs> saved it all. It's like the blooper reel. It's perfect. <laughs> Just hours now that you're a doctor, you can handle it. Let's do the whole blooper in, reel. In the beginning. Oh, they gave you a degree? Here's all the stuff you didn't want to be seen on the internet. Oh, you feel good about yourself? We're going to fix that real fast. I, oh for, for new listeners, Aline was the poster child of like emailing me like three days later is hey dave can you cut out that thing that i said that was perfectly <laughs> normal and natural thing to say was but a perfectly which, nuanced expression but which of i feel strongly oh, is going to destroy my life and or hurt other people or whatever somebody just and, oh, you know God. like every email was a company it was was oh, if, if i could have responded verbally to every email or every text or whatever that she sent it would have been like Yes, Celine. <laughs> well, okay, to be I'd fair, be, it I'd wasn't be you. Happy to. <laughs> you remember Corey? Oh, Corey yeah. was the intern on the Corey show. The intern, and he yeah. God, he was Corey great. He was intern. such a Yeah, he was awesome. He would come here and It's like our little uh, golden retriever. I mean, yeah, he's in med school now. I think <laughs> no. he ended up in Missouri somewhere, Kansas, but yeah. or maybe DMU. I think he went to DMU. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so you have no right to complain. Corey has every right to complain because he was the one who was like, all right, sure, yeah. And you know what? He never did complain. He was really like, I had he my, had no business being as cool about that as he was. I had my but share. You all did, right. You did. We need to move on okay. from you. <laughs> well, all right. Dave just rolled Look, his eyes. Look, you got, you got two degrees out of this. We're done. We're yeah. moving on. <laughs> You love it. Don't even act like you don't, Dave. Dave, think about how much extra content you got out of her by doing two degrees. Think of how many <laughs> terabytes of bullshit. No. Dave, how many clicks bullshit. did you get out of this? I have no idea. <laughs> Our episode today is sponsored by Panacea Financial. It's a nationwide digital bank built for doctors by doctors. Panacea Financial is designed for medical students and residents as it was founded by two doctors that were financially frustrated during their training. Thousands of doctors have used their PRN personal loan to avoid credit cards and use a better way to cover expenses for residency, relocation, or other life expenses. Panacea's PRN personal loan does not require a cosigner, has no minimum credit score requirement, and has interest rates starting at half of a typical credit card. They also offer a period of no or reduced payments on their PRN personal loan. So go to panaceafinancial.com slash matchday to learn more about Panacea and get other helpful information on Match Day, Residency Transition. Panacea Financial is a division of Premise, member FDIC. Thanks for the support, Panacea. Let's get back to the podcast. It's that time of year again. Another class of pre-meds is preparing for their application cycle. And as they begin taking the MCAT and writing their application essays and all of the hoops that we will make you jump through to get here, let's talk about where to look for help, especially if you don't have access to pre-med advisors and how to differentiate good and bad advice. Think back to when you're, if it's possible, Aline, think back to when you were a little pre-med, bright eyed and bushy tailed and seeking advice on how this worked. Oof. This is really an open question to everybody. Do you remember like what you, where you went and what, how you figured out, am I getting good advice here? or Am I getting bad advice? Yeah, so I, I'm an M1, so I did this process within the last two years. I would avidly encourage people to avoid places like Student Doctor Network. Agree. And also mm -hmm. Reddit. There's a sense of neuroticism that comes from people that are trying to compete with 30,000 other applicants on the internet, and it is not helpful. 
not only is the advice not helpful, the emotions that you're going to get out of it are going to ruin the whole experience for you. But if you're a, if you're a a pre-med who doesn't have access to other resources, like you're a first gen, you're going to be a first gen medical student, or you don't have family members who are in medicine or other people that you can turn to for advice. Is there a way to look at those resources like Reddit and SDN and, and put them in a context that allows you to use them? So if you could avoid and feel free to jump in anybody, but I mean, there are other resources out there that are really good. I'm a huge fan of what's, it's not Dorian Gray. What's his name? Dr. Oh, Ryan Gray. Ryan Gray. Yeah. Yes. Not Dorian Gray. There's not, not a Dorian of him somewhere. Um, sorry, sorry, everybody. <laughs> Dorian Gray. Huge fan uh, <laughs> of the guy in the painting. Yeah. Beautiful painting. Let me yeah. tell you. He puts out a lot of content. You can find a lot of really good advice from his podcast or his YouTube channel or something like that, right? Just scroll through until you find an episode that, that clicks for you. But the problem with trying to find Reddit and Student Doctor Network is unless you have somebody that you know that is in it, it's really hard to tell like is this person just jaded and grumpy is this person like what are they not telling me or is this person trying to show off online which again like who cares you know like Mm -hmm. a medical student that's like oh yeah i went to like harvard for undergrad and i was valedictorian and i'm still at the same medical school as everybody else i'm like oh great i don't like Mm -hmm. what are you showing off for it doesn't make sense you know so try to avoid those two things i think mostly people that seem extra jaded and Anyone that's putting all of their stats in a oh, given yeah. question, you should be red flag immediately. Anyone yeah. that's got GPA, school, all their extracurriculars, every piece of their medical <laughs> application and the end question is like, am I going to get in anywhere? Mm. Red flag. Yeah. Don't yeah. even. Don't the moment you see numbers, thread. red flag. But you, the don't whole think, thread. Yeah. but you don't think that's driven by the sort of uncertainty of the application process. And it all that kind is. Of stuff. I yeah. was the student though. I was the student that I didn't, I went to an undergrad institution. I went to Iowa state university. They do not have a medical school. Yeah. They have a plethora of pre-meds. I was not one of them. I was not a pre-med. I was doing an engineering degree. Therefore it wasn't very common to go into medicine. So I had a pre-med advisor that told me this is a bad idea. You're probably going down the wrong path. You're making this decision too late. Just generally bad idea. That was bad advice. The problem with that is I went to one pre-med advisor who told me this is not a good idea. And I immediately went to the student doctor networks, the reddits. That was like my that was my place that I was getting most of this information because I didn't have the resources in a lot of ways on campus, nor was I willing to try to find new pre-med advisors at Iowa State, which might have been helpful. I think what ended up being my saving grace was that I was connected with a student that had graduated from my degree program that ultimately had become an MD, PhD student. So having that one-on-one mentoring became a way in which I could sift through some of the BS that you find on student doctor network and reddit so i have a hard time with this question now knowing that those and i'll just use those two websites they were both really vital resources in my application cycle i would literally never recommend that to anyone ever having gone through (laughs) that like this is the feel like this is what everybody says which is so hard because like i don't actually know what the perfect solution is though that i would have done i think i would have had more individual mentors i would have found better pre-med advisors, I probably would have reached out to somebody at the University of Iowa saying, hey, I'm an Iowa State student. I do yeah. not have this resource. Yeah. Can, who can I talk to? Yeah, this is, I feel like this is the most, if we say, if you hear nothing else <laughs> today, mm-hmm. reach out to a medical school or two or three yeah. and ask your questions of them. They're the people who are going to be able to answer those questions. With- I'm just going to just to be about or reach out to any pre-med advisor at any other institution. Mm-hmm. Like they're often not being f- like fully exploited by the students there. They have a lot of knowledge. I'm sure they'll be happy to talk and maybe not. I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> I think that's reasonable. Yeah. So you want to you want to get your advice. from. I love the way you like- ended that. <laughs> so you started out so certain and then <laughs> just, just went just straight, straight the down the shitter and then. <laughs> But you get what I mean, not just the med school, but go to a pre-med advisor at an institution that has a med school and talk with, because they have the best sense of how to help their students maybe get into that med school. But yeah. so yeah. far, step one is find an individual person who is not currently going through the med school application cycle yeah. to get advice from, yeah. whether that be an advisor or a student 
currently in medical school or who has gone through the process. Yeah, I think that that's really what you want. You want somebody that's not so emotionally invested and like in pain because of the process right now, right? Mm. Another phenomenal free resource, because I'm all about those free resources, All Access Med School Admissions. It's a podcast. It's put on by the admissions director at Case Western, which is a top 30 school. And he interviews admissions directors at all different kinds of medical schools across the country. Mm. And... If you're like really wondering what are the admissions offices at medical school trying to do, that's a phenomenal resource, right? Yeah. People that aren't currently going through it and can give you a little bit of professional advice. I think, <clears throat> yeah, the big thing is you just don't want to be listening to people that are currently being beat up by the system. It, it is an easy source to look to. I mean, yeah. it is. Google like a lot of any given on, question, right. you're going to get two to three actual resources and then immediately you're going to get. Reddit and Student Doctor Network. I still get this when I look up yeah. medical questions or residency questions. This is not, yeah. I'm not away from this yet at all. Yeah. I think another place to look is someone who was recently successful at what you're trying to do. Yeah. And I really want to echo what Riley said about finding someone who studied the same thing as you in college and were successful in that. And maybe even taking a step back from that, like looking at someone who is doing what you want to do and then figuring out what steps they took to get there and then doing that. the broader picture of like, oh yeah, this person is a pediatrician. What school did they go to? How did they get into med school? How did they get into residency? You know, stuff like that. And also just cold email like crazy. That's the other hard thing is just because someone doesn't respond to your email, it's not, it's not personal, personal at mm-hmm. all. I mean, people get hundreds, you just have no idea. Maybe maybe they just got divorced or like maybe they have a parent that died. Like they're not maybe they're just not checking. Maybe I they're remember. on fire. Maybe they're on fire. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I, people get busy. <laughs> people, it's, it's very fire's busy. People get busy. They're on fire. It's easy to get preoccupied with that. But, you know, I'll tell you what. Recently, I got an email like when I was first putting my this elective class together. There was someone at this institution that I emailed about potentially being a lecturer. It was around the pandemic, actually. It was like. April or May of 2020 and I'd emailed her and two years later she emailed me back and was like Aline I've been meaning to get in touch with you for a long time at the very moment that you emailed me I developed a life-threatening medical condition and have been in and out of the hospital for a long time however I never forgot your email and I was like wow don't worry about it (laughs) 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 totally cool don't worry about it I love to hear from you. And then we talked and it was just like, you just never know. Like they could have just dropped dead actually. So (laughs) the thing about mentoring too, (laughs) I mean, I'm I'm just going to move right on from the drop. Yes. Riley, please transitioning. The thing about the cold emailing, I think it seems so scary. The worst thing that can happen is somebody just doesn't respond to you or just says, I don't have a lot of time right now to do that task. Both of those are like totally fine. But best case scenario is that you find someone who actually really enjoys mentoring somebody else. There is nothing in some ways that brings me joy than getting to like relive the process in hindsight. Mm. It is so joyful to like go through the process to do something like the podcast. But even more so, I've mentored quite a few individual students at this point in either just one meeting meeting or multiple meetings across multiple semesters and it's so awesome to be able to help them not make the same mistakes. That yeah, I Riley made. has just given more. everybody who's a pre-med permission to send her an email. I well, it, <laughs> And then I will give you permission to also accept that I am too busy. Also, also <laughs> possible, right? But those who I end up getting connected with through Send an email to pre-med, pre-med lover 869. Send it to yeah, pre-med lover 869 <laughs> at, at I'm sponsored by Reddit. <laughs> no, but it's so awesome. And I think a lot of people feel this same way, which is to be able to like impart some of the wisdom and struggles that they went through onto this kind of next generation of people who are going through it only in the hopes that it's just a little bit less frightening for those people who go through it. Your email is just yeah. hundreds of people emailing you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, to be fair, yeah, I barely wanted to read through my own personal statement. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> I won't help you there, but yeah. I can give you general advice. You I'll give you like ideas. grammatical yeah. structure yeah. comments, but there is something really soul feeding though about making sure like making your pain someone else's gain. Yes. It's kind of what I'm yeah. hearing you say. And that is kind of the only form of relief from things that have happened to me or, or mistakes that I've made besides time is just seeing another person not go through that. Mm-hmm. Honestly. Yeah. When I was applying to med school, 
my I went to a small state school with not very many resources. My pre med advisor wasn't particularly able to accommodate not just me, but just everybody who was a pre med. We did have a pretty big pre med program. And it was very successful. She's a great advisor, but she just didn't have enough bandwidth to walk every person through every step of the process. And using the R slash pre med guide is actually what helped me the most with the application process, like making sure that I have my secondaries pre-written and ready to send out as soon as I get an application for the med school, mm-hmm. giving me tips on how, how to interview, how to set up my timeline so that I'm not getting all mixed up with anything, missing any deadlines. So yeah, I'm a fan of Reddit, but definitely stay away from all the threads that are like, these are my stats, what are my ch- chances, where should I apply to you? Because that will only end up being very toxic in the comments there are Um, good threads yeah yeah i know there are there are okay to be fair the the problem is that people use things like reddit or student doctor network a lot of times one because they're neurotic or two which this is not i'm not dumping on people the neurotic i get it i was there but two the other one is they use it to vent and if they're using it to vent i promise you you're not going to get a lot of useful information out of it we kind of talked about this there's a whole other episode that we should make about the match and the feelings around the match and something dave and i were talking about is the fact that for like my top five or six programs i set myself up to be disappointed no matter where i matched because i had allowed myself to really fully envision myself in each of these five places and so no matter where i matched i was gonna i was setting myself up to mourn six other ver- or five other versions of my life that i was now gonna be missing out on and so something that i think was kind of useful for me was going on um our medical school or our residency match or whatever I don't know that I would recommend this, but it ended up being very validating for me to log on and just see people, you know, kind of wondering out loud what went wrong. And as I was reading these, I it took some time for me to do soul searching to realize like, oh, I did this to myself, actually. I allowed myself to really fantasize about all these different places instead of just letting the process take its course and doing everything that I could. And so venting may not be a source of really useful information, but sometimes finding other people going through the same feelings as you can be validating. Yeah. But then you run the risk of you shouldn't live there. You can go and visit. You can be a tourist there, but you can't set up camp there and stay there forever. I will agree with that. We're going to we're gonna go ahead and get back to Ted Lasso here <laughs> since we talked about this earlier. Mm-hmm. The only thing worse than being miserable is being miserable and alone. So that's entirely true. Mm-hmm. And... The thing about going through the pre-med process is even the ones that are successful had lots of time where they were miserable and you're not alone. But like you said, like you got to do the goldfish thing. You got to be there for a minute, get your tears out, and then you got to forget it and you got to move forward. What are some red flags that you want to avoid? I do agree that telling everyone to stay off these websites is ultimately not going to be the most fruitful advice that we could give. So yeah. we already talked about it. Red flag is probably the post that is, here's all of my stats I did a thousand amazing things. I have a 4.0 GPA. I got a, what is the highest score on the MCAT? 527 on the MCAT. I don't think I'm going to get into any XYZ school that they've listed. That's not super helpful. There are threads that are helpful, like AJ has mentioned. Like, I think that one of the good ones is some of the, hey, I'm feeling really sad about this. Am I alone? And then most of the comments are, hey, you're not alone. This is how I feel X, Y, Z. Yeah, sad those well. are super wholesome. You can Agreed. even get a lot out of basically if they tag anything that says like venting or anything like that, just avoid that thread. You're going to have a bad time, but mm. you can still get a lot out of somebody just asking a very innocuous question like, hey, I've got some interviews coming up. What are some general tips for interview day? Right. You people are going to be a lot less emotionally charged on that and you might get some pretty decent advice. But if it's emotionally charged, I think those are going to be your red flag. Shortcoats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Thank you. I would say that the one red flag <laughs> that I can think of is the absolutist. Yes. Oh, somebody yeah. who's like... Only cis deal in absolutes. That's... I mean, it's somebody who's like, especially a pre-med advisor, who's like... Uh, don't bother. It's don't not, bother. Your, yeah, dream is, your dream is done. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's just <clears throat> bullshit. That's very true. Yeah. I'd say the other thing to avoid is looking at the median as a, some sort of cutoff. 
Mm. So a lot of schools yeah. will publish their median MCAT, their median GPA for the incoming class or whatever. That's the middle value. Mm -hmm. It means nothing yeah. in terms of whether or not you're going to get into that school or not. I don't even know if that statistic is especially helpful. The I one that I found to be incredibly helpful to give me an actual idea of what we're looking at here was NYU. Now, full disclosure, I'm going to Iowa, not NYU. <laughs> <laughs> but wait a minute. <laughs> but on their wait, site. Wait, this is in New York City? <laughs> right? Been bamboozled. My goodness, uh, I thought I was getting a great deal on rent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they posted on their admissions site the lowest MCAT and GPA score that they accepted and the highest MCAT and GPA score that they accepted, mm -hmm. as well as their median. Other ways of doing this, the MSAR is reasonably helpful because they'll give you not only median, which is the person right in the middle, not, that's not even an average, that's the person right in the middle, mm -hmm. but they'll also give you the 25th and 75th percentiles. They'll even give you the 10th and 90th percentiles. So that gives you a wide range of what the last class did. Even that's not perfect to, to decide whether or not you could get in there, but it is more helpful than just looking at, well, the person right in the middle got a, a 515, so I guess I can't do that, right? That literally means half of the student body got less than a 515. Yeah. I think just the stats in general are so hard because you think that, oh, well, if they're going to XYZ school, they must at least have the average. Or yeah. You see all these people, and again, it's people bragging. They get on during med school acceptance time, and they say, I got into 10 schools. Well, spoiler, you only need one school yeah. to yeah. let you in. To you're like actually be able only to, going to one you're school. You're only you know? ever going to go to one school. You literally just need yeah. one school. And so seeing all these people, I think you have to have a really tough skin to not mm. end up down some degree of imposter syndrome. And that sucks because it really should just be an exciting time. It should be, I got into this one medical school and that's super awesome. Or I got waitlisted and that's still really awesome because it's a step toward the direction of my uh, my dreams. Or even just like, I didn't find out I was going to medical school next year. Let's let's take a day and reassess and try it again. Yeah. So, let's eat ice cream together, guys. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I just... It's so hard because I think a lot of people go into medical school with some degree of imposter syndrome, but I've now spent the last four years of my life trying to break away the imposter syndrome and or become more comfortable with its fact. But I think in a lot of ways, the net power of Reddit and Student Doctor Network is only going to increase the imposter syndrome that a lot of us feel. And that kind of sucks. The problem is that we can now very easily compare ourselves not to the pre-meds at our institution, but every pre-med, not even in just our country, every pre-med that's trying to get into a medical school in the United States. And every pre-med that's done it for the last 10 years. That's so yeah. unhealthy. It's not good. You yeah. can, don't compare yourself to 100,000 people. That's not going to go well for you. I think you mentioned the MSAR. I think that's worth mentioning is focus on like there's a lot of resources out there that are objective reporting like objectively reporting the information that you're looking for because like the power of one person's version of reality can really wield a lot of power on your psyche but for residency Frida is really good Texas Star like resources like that that are curated that are statistically relevant that are verifiable like that and someone had the expertise to develop this resource and make it meaningful but yeah, some of these posts are just very overwhelming, Were but there? everyone's just looking for validation. Yeah. Everyone's freaked out. I, I think you brought up a very important point here, which is something that I feel we would be remiss if we didn't say. Do not use the U.S. news for figuring out what schools you want to apply to. Yeah. The schools themselves no longer want to use the U.S. news to decide how to rank themselves. Yeah, even the you, schools that are still doing it are like, well, I mean, great for Harvard that they backed out of that situation, but... Yeah, it is not. We don't love it either, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is not useful for you as a student applying. Were there things that influenced your cycle, your outcomes when you were applying that you can think of either negative or positive? Yes. Boop. Okay. I took the MCAT in June. Spoiler, you have to apply starting June 1st. I took it June 30th. <laughs> it was a bad idea. I got bad advice. Like the moral of my story is that a lot of my advice is like, Somebody don't do what I did. Somebody advised you to take it in June? No, nobody advised me. Oh, That's nobody why advised I took it in June. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The flip and side then I is... just threw a Hail Mary, see, saw what happened. It worked out. But like, again, don't do that. Take the MCAT with like 
plenty of wiggle room. Don't be yeah. taking it like try to get your applications in June 1st. Don't take the don't take the MCAT June 30th and then apply when you get your score back. You really got to talk to people who just went through it, especially if it's a process that's changing a lot. Yeah, I will say some things that I could have done better on you the have flip side two or of the three ju- months to June. Get. Yes, I actually took the MCAT in April, the Saturday before finals weeks for that semester. That was also dreadfully just don't do that. Whatever you do, that was a miserable semester for me. Mm. It worked out, but I probably the exception to that rule. Yeah. Uh, I will also say things that we've learned in both of these examples. You don't have to do everything exactly by the book, exactly how Reddit would say you have to do exactly like every pre-med advisor. Sometimes things work out. However, I would say don't take that advice. Try to yeah. do things for like your mental health, look, along for your, the yeah. way yeah. that like, you go should. Go for general trends. Try to find <laughs> the general trends of what <laughs> seems to be successful. And if your situation doesn't allow for that, know that it can still work out. Correct. I think that's, I think that's a fair way to, yes, to look at it. Some things that also like really hurt me. So I'm a non-trad. Yeah. I had some family situations over the years that led to quite a few W's on my transcript uh-huh. and some health situations. Uh-huh. And um, that does not look good. But knowing how to have a conversation about that before you go into interviews would look a lot better. I did not do that well. And that definitely hurt my chances at several institutions that I interviewed at. So if there are things that are quote unquote red flags on your transcript, I still got the interview. Mm-hmm. They still wanted to have a conversation with me. But Make sure that you prepare to have a conversation about what that means for your journey and how that builds into your story. They want to know that you can finish now that you've started. They're already interested. You're on the you're on the first date, but you got to make sure that you're able to have a conversation with those things. I couldn't do it because I just didn't prepare for it. So be better than that, I guess. Practice makes perfect yeah. with stuff like that. Yeah, um, you, I don't think you're going to get it, quote unquote, right out of the gate. Yeah, I mean, um, the best way to do it is because you're raising such an important point. I think a lot of people do run into the situation where there is something kind of not questionable, but just something curious about their background and no like and that's really the hard thing about interviews is like working out the lingo and like working out how exactly but very succinctly talking about a thing. And like for residents, I, and sorry, I keep coming back to residents because it's what well, I, that's your most recent thing. It's what yeah, I recently went through, yeah. but I would never advise someone to take interviews for programs that they're not seriously considering. However, the best way to practice for interviews is to go on interviews, yeah. go take every interview you can and turn down any interviews for programs. You're really not because that's taking a spot away from someone who is seriously considering that place, but that is the best way. And then save the places that you have your heart set on the most towards the end. Once you're like, you're really, you've really ground it down. You've got, you've got it just down to a science. Do you have that level of control when setting up interviews? Uh, for med school? I don't, I imagine it it's, yeah. It's like some places will, depending on when you get your interview. Like I got my Iowa interview pretty early on in the summer, but I got interviews elsewhere earlier that I couldn't necessarily put, say like it was, to a med school that I really wanted to go to. It was mm. well known, so on and so forth. I would have wanted to do that interview later, but because I got it relatively early on, the only spots open were earlier spots than say my Iowa interview. So you kind of have to play within the nuances there as well. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. I think I didn't plan it this way. And, and this is a, a long conversation maybe for a different episode, but it worked out really nicely where I bunched the majority of my interviews in like a three week period in January. <laughs> so there was like, <laughs> it was like a two and a half or three week stretch where I just had like interviews every single day. And it was actually perfect. Cause it was, I was, it was like marathon training and every interview I had just gave me like better and sharper answers for my next interview. And I, as much as I could, sometimes you don't have a lot of control, but I did try to like gauge the ones I was least excited about first. And the ones I was like, I really wanted to show up in like my best ball gown towards the end. And a lot of people weren't against Is this for interview. residency or med school? Interviews? So this is for residency because med school was a lot like med school applications were a long, it's not, probably not even relevant anymore. But for residency, everyone argues against interviewing later. And we've kind of talked about this. I don't think it's a bad idea to interview late because a lot of the people that matched to the programs that I ranked 
I remember interviewed with me. Mm -hmm. So like, I think there's something about interviewing a leader where you're just fresher in their memories. And, but, you know, maybe interviewing first is also good because they'll remember the first and the last and the people in the middle kind of blend together. Well, also, and, I've been told that some programs rank their, I don't know if rank is the right word, but some, some programs rank their interviewees like, the day that they interview. Yeah. And then use that information to feed into their overall rank list. They must mean like score them. Yeah. Like something like, like that. based on their interview, like they get a score that day and then that's what like some sort goes of into the yeah. record. I yeah. think that we do have some control over that with med school interviews, depending on how many you get. Right. I will say for those of you out there who, and it will happen that don't get a lot of interviews and you are so stressed because you didn't get 10 schools to practice. This that is before a you get really good point one. you're about to make. Listen yeah. up. Yeah. There are places that you can practice interviewing. You can practice. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest doing is going on to like the Ryan Gray, not Dorian Gray, Ryan Gray. <laughs> He'll do mock interviews with people and he posts those on YouTube. Yeah. The value of that for you is not necessarily seeing their answers. That could be helpful, but seeing the questions. Right. And then you can practice those yeah. questions with your friends or your family members. And I say, hey, how did that how did that my answer come off in that? That's if you don't have a pre-med program where you can do that. Or maybe you can even find people that recently got in. My last semester, I did a lot of mock interviews with other people in the pre-med program because that's what they were really scared about. So mm -hmm. that's what we had time to do. So there are ways that you can practice, even if you can't actually practice on quote unquote game day. The, yeah. Point, yeah. the point I thought you were going to make. You tried to read my mind I and I'm just not as smart as you. And, 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 there's just nothing I up there. I thought you were going to make is, oh, is remember that most people only get a few interviews. I mean, that's very yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe less than three. Yeah, I mean, I didn't I didn't. And get most people only get into so. one school. The, the people who are posting on Reddit or whatever saying, you know, I had to make a choice, you know, like these uh, Sankey plots, I feel like. I don't, oh, you know. they're so toxic. Yeah, I Those know what you're so talking annoying. about. They're pretty yeah. to look at, though. They are, and yeah. I, I find them to be aesthetically very pleasing. They strike me as information-esque. Yeah. <laughs> Information, -ish. information, informative. -ish. I, I like them for budgets. I don't love them for how people handle them for interviews. <laughs> I don't know what they. T I don't know what they tell another person. Aline has to go. I have an exam at two, so I my last one in med school, guys. Oh, oh my god! I'm almost free. Oh my gosh! It'll be you soon. It will be you soon. It will be you soon. Trust me. But that is the dream. It's already there. Year. It's a <laughs> It's a nice moment. So sorry. I, That's all right. I should have slipped away. Dave is in denial right now. When well, like, I, are you done with clerkships and everything? Or? Today's my last day of my last clerkship of med What's school. What's your plan? Like, what do you do now? I'm going to go to a conference and then next week I'm going to go to New Jersey. So I match peds at Rutgers. I'm super stoked oh about gosh. it. Congrats. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you. So I'm going to go uh, to New Brunswick and just look for a new place to live awesome. and potentially meets the new interns seem really nice. like I was telling Dave we started a someone started a whatsapp like almost immediately after match I was like oh these people are really nice like I could I could have a breakdown in front of you and like I'd be <laughs> it'd be all right you seem pretty cool <laughs> so yeah so on the I'm subject excited. of like morning potentialities that was a program that it wasn't like I think Iowa in my mind I would rather have gone to because of the programs here but I built out a whole life going to Rutgers for medical school Dude, and yeah. when I didn't go there I had to mourn that potentiality, you know, like, isn't it something? Yeah. It's like it's a crazy. whole, it's like a, a path of your life that has been erased yeah, yeah. and if, it's all imaginary, but like I apply to a lot of Such programs. Such a good and point. It's all I, bullshit. I, I want that for, you know, it's you all in your head. You can put this part in for the, for the pre-meds. Be kind to those that are mourning, even if they get an acceptance, because there's a part of themselves yes. that they've had to let go of. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're they're not, you know, of course, they get to live their dream of being a doctor, but there's still a part of themselves that they have to mourn. Let them. A lot of this stuff ties into our identity. And I've never seen people become as unhinged and as just emotionally just upset, just distraught as when their identity is threatened. And yeah. a lot of people 
you know, come to see living in a certain place or like following a certain specialty or going to a certain med school as a big part of their identity. And when that doesn't materialize, it's like a, a pillar of their identity is kind of ripped out and it, everything feels very unstable. And that was something I noticed on Reddit after match days. A lot of people, just a lot of back and forth of like, hey, stop complaining. You matched. But also like, hey, let people have their feelings. Like, it's cool that they matched. But there's just a lot, a lot of Don't feelings. Don't yuck other down. people's yums. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or let you people have other people's yucks, I guess. In this I case. like don't. I feel like I'm starting this process now of like, there's like yeah. a few cities that I would really like to maybe be in at some point. Sure. I'm like, I don't want to get so excited about them. But I also don't want to get so excited about anywhere. It's like, how do you just be okay with anything, even though like you're not? Because it's not only your livelihood, I think, it's I think your the partner's message, livelihood and everything. I don't know. I think the message of this conversation is that you're probably, I mean, yes, best avoided uh, <laughs> this fantasizing about where you will be because yes. it may not come to the come to pass. But if you can't help it. I mean, give but it's so fun. Little, so you're it's, saying give I yourself should. a little like, room to be. I shouldn't Zillow the like places that I could live in <laughs> the towns that I that I imagine years before I am thinking about graduating. So I just finished like, this lovely book this? called Bittersweet by Susan Cain. I highly recommend this book for everybody. But one of her big points in it is that no, do that. That is one of the okay. like kind of fundamental fun, yeah. human experiences to yearn for something. For the record, to use your I imagination, add such breadth and depth to your life. I need even a little though yearning. you have to mourn it, yearn for it. It makes you more of a person. It's exciting. It keeps me going. Thing. It reminds it's also me kind that of there's like an saying, end. Yeah. Like yeah. it's also kind of like saying, you know, don't fall in love; they'll just break your heart. I mean, yeah. that's dumb. I, but it's so fun to be in love. I yeah. didn't get into like my number one medical school. Yeah. To be fair, I think like the person that I wanted to be when I was applying to medical school and the person that I am now are very different. Yeah. And so my yes. whole life perspective on where I want to go is actually very different. It worked out better than I'm here. That's doesn't, that doesn't have to be the case, yeah. right? It just happened to be with me that it was, but mm. I still mourned that looking back. I'm still glad I applied like yeah. that. That gave me like, I don't know that inspiration to like, that's my goal. I don't know. It, I think I'm a I could not agree it. more. I oh. could not agree more. I, I did not match my number one. I'm thrilled about where I matched. And the more I'm learning about it, the more I'm realizing like it's actually like pretty perfect for me. But yeah. I had to go through this moment of mourning a version of myself that I'm realizing like I never was that. Like yeah. it's a fantasy of who I wanted yeah. to be. But like my number one was in New York City. And now that my boyfriend and I have looked at places to live in New York City because Rutgers is not that far. There are people who live in New York and commute down. And the more we're learning about New York, we're like, oh, they just appointed a rat czar because of the <laughs> problem. I just read this yesterday. <laughs> right. He was like, Aline, we are not we are not city people to that extent to go from like Iowa to New York City. It's a little much. We're too high strung for that. I was like, you're right. I'd be miserable every day. I'd be stressed out. Every the rats day. run that city. They really do. They I, really my, do. So my family lives in New York. <laughs> I so wish that I had gotten into medical school in New York. I love New York. The rats are part of our culture. It's part of our identity. <laughs> this, is anti-rat yeah. this is anti-rat czar now. This is anti-rat czar propaganda. Keep the rats, man. The rats are <laughs> the rats just trying are to... Friends, look, I don't have to own a pet because every time I go and use the subway, I've got like 30 of them. Yeah. It's, cool. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. All right, we've got to wrap this up. Uh, AJ uh, needs to go get a sandwich or whatever. I have they're experiments to do. We all have things. Yeah. Go, go get your salmon. Have uh, a good conference, dude. Enjoy that lunch. Thanks. Have good fun. Good seeing you all. Lean, congratulations. <sighs> thanks, dog. Well, we'll catch up soon when you're back in town, but yeah, thank you. For sure. Appreciate you. All right. Have Bye. a great weekend, y'all. That's Bye. our show. Jeff, Lean, Riley, thanks for being on the show with me today as well thrilled to be here thanks dave and what kind of low stat bad attitude slumping moron slumping <laughs> i don't know what i meant by that slumping moron would i be if i didn't thank you short quotes for making us part of your week if you're new and you like what you hear today follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available like spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and youtube thank you to this week's editor aj chowdhury and the producers of this episode matt Engelkin and AJ Chowdhury. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine student government and ongoing support. From the Writing and Humanities program, our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying, don't let the bastards on Reddit get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, Life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but 
In my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. This short code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.